Hello everybody, Ben Bowers of Drama Day is back uh, a relatively short space of time since the last one as well but um, I wouldn't hold your breath for getting used to this. Anyway, uh, Dram number 376, whatever we're on, um, and we are going for something quite unusual now. Um, this is a, a sample that was um, given to me, you'll recognise the bottle if you've seen some of the other videos, by a good friend and the person with possibly the most eclectic and widespread collection of whiskey in the world. It is Andrew A.P. Butler. Um, and uh, this one is Telsa, uh, which is from the tiny country of Liechtenstein. So before I uh, crack into this and get the thing open, um, let's find out a little bit more about the distillery itself. The Telsa distillery is located in Treason, close to the Swiss border in the tiny country of Liechtenstein, a country with an area of 62 square miles and a population of only 38,500. It's the oldest distillery in the country, operating since 1880, and is under the fourth generation of family ownership. The owners, Sebastian and Marcel Telsa, are in that fourth generation, and Marcel himself is the master distiller. While the distillery originally produced brandies and fruit spirits and liqueurs, since 2006 single malt whiskey was produced, matured in Pinot Noir barrels sourced from the healthy wine producing market in the country. Unusually, an open wood fire is used under the still. While this used to be the traditional way to heat spirit in still, it's difficult to regulate temperature, which in turn hinders consistency, so most distilleries will now use electric or gas heating. But some would argue an open wood fire creates more character in each batch. So, let's get into the dram itself. Quite looking forward to this. Um, anything that's unusual, particularly from a small country or something a little bit different. Um, so the notes I've got, and uh, as I probably said on the blurb itself about the distillery, talks about them being matured in Pinot Noir casks. Now, upon reflection, I'm not entirely sure whether everything that they bottle is bottled in Pinot Noir casks. This was just basically information that I took from one of the websites, of which there are not many that are actually in English. And my German, which is what most of the um, websites I was uh, coming across, my German is awful. So if anybody does know a bit more about Telsa and can give me a little bit more information to just to clarify things, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, however, this is uh, the um, Telsa X1 Pinot Noir. So this is what the bottle looks like. Um, now, you can't actually get this in the UK. Um, Master of Malt, uh, they do a gin as well, uh, the Telsa gin. Um, Master of Malt lists the gin, uh, but nowhere in the UK that I could find actually list um, the, any of their whiskies. They've got a couple as well, so there's a few other um, uh, releases that they do. What I'm not sure is whether they are all in Pinot Noir casks or ex bourbon, ex sherry, anything like that. Um, this is X1 Pinot Noir. I don't know if this is just finished in Pinot Noir or fully matured in Pinot Noir. I don't know what the age is because there's no age statement on the label that I can see. So I don't know. This this is quite a mystery. Um, so let me just get my bit of cloth. Ooh, it's a bit awkward to do, but let's get that nice and close to the camera and then put that up there. Now. If it was fully matured in Pinot Noir Cass, I would expect more of a kind of pinky ready character to it. So my guess is that it's not fully matured, it's probably just um, finished. Um, and even then for a finish, compared to some red wine casts that I've had before, I would expect a bit more of a, a pinky tinge to it. So we shall see. Um, let's go straight into the nose. Now, this is bottled at, and just let me check my notes because I can't remember, it's either 43, oh no, this is 52.9, I'm thinking about something else. 52.9, so cash strength, however, I don't have any water with me, which is probably a mistake, so we'll see what it's like. Because it's pretty fiery on the nose, and I was going to say, if this is 40, 43, something like that, actually it's quite powerful, but 52.9 does make more sense with what's on the nose. It's quite fiery, but there is a... There is a fruitiness coming through. Um, it's not uh, overpowering that alcohol content. And it is a red fruit. It's almost uh, cherries, black cherries. There's lighter red berries as well. Not quite strawberry. We're looking at maybe red currants, blackberries as well. There's cherry stones. The cherry that's there is quite dry. It's definitely cherry stones. Interesting though, I quite like this. I'm not a big fan of cherries, but this is like dark cherry, quite strong, but then cherry stones as well. Mm. 
Mm. So the heat is there to start with. You're getting that burn on the front of your tongue. But actually, as it travels through the mouth, starts to go down the side, gets to the back of the throat, there's there's a good mouthfeel to it. It's actually quite thick. That cherry note continues, almost like cherry syrup. So for 52.9, yes, there is heat there, but it's not overpowering at all. I am definitely getting a cherry pie element. There is um, cherry pie with a uh, thick short crust pastry with sugar on the top that's been caramelized. There is a really nice sweetness to it, but it's that almost syrupy character to it. It's actually, I wish I had some water. In fact, do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pause it, I'm gonna get some water, and I'm gonna put some in, because I do think maybe just a drop of water, I'm hoping, will open this out even more. So bear with me two seconds. water and I also have a pipette thing. Now I've only had kind of one sip of this so I'm gonna have another one because I've got a healthy amount in here. Actually taking another note, uh, another note, another nose. Again alcohol content although it's high not overbearing at all. Almost like I've kind of got used to that prickle that's there. good mouthfeel. I really like the thickness to it. The whininess is starting to come through now. Now Pinot Noir, traditionally quite a vegetal, vegetal. it's a lighter type of um, red wine, but there is a kind of funky vegetal, some people really hate Pinot Noir. I struggle with Pinot Noir because if it gets too vegetal, it's almost off-putting. But this whininess is now starting to come through. And I think that's that cherry stone element that I was getting to start with is actually that wine influence. Definitely, yeah. It is plum, cherry, nectarine, damsons, really fruity, really orchard fruit, my autumnal fruits. So I'm gonna put some water in. Now I'm just, I'm trying to judge. I've still got a fair bit in this. I think you might give me a larger bottle than normal. So I'm gonna put just a little bit in and see how we go with that. What I'm hoping is this is just gonna take that little edge off, that little spiciness, and allow that fruitiness to come through. Okay, on the nose, much better. Much more of that fruit, red fruit character. That Pinot Noir element's definitely coming through. Hmm, interesting. So, the fruitiness is still there, but what is now coming through is not heat and fire from alcohol, it's actually a dry tannin element. I can feel my mouth drying, as you do get with red wine, with a high tannin content. They kind of suck the moisture out of your mouth. Clear red wine influence on this now. Strange, because I wouldn't pick it from the color at all. And the wine influence with water is very much more prevalent than it was without water. Without the water, as I say, cherry pie, there was kind of short crust pastry, there was a sweetness, there was a caramelized sugar there, but there was definitely dark red fruits, cherries, plums, damsons, that sort of thing. This is more obvious of there is a red wine character in this, and it's quite a dry red wine. So you're getting that fruitiness from the Pinot Noir, but you're getting quite a tannin influence as well. Now, I've had some red wine cask 
um, whiskies where that tannin element has been a little bit too much. From recollection, the um, New Zealand collection that was um, finished in Cabernet Sauvignon casts, I can't remember what number that was, but that was way back in the day of the drama day. That was too overpowering. The tannin was too overpowering. Ben Romack have their Sassicaia and Chateau Cizac um, wood finishes. The Sassicaia, the tannin is slightly more prevalent than the Cizac, and I personally prefer the Cizac because the tannin influence isn't quite as quite as on the nose. This is on the drier side. If you like dry red wines and you like whiskey, then this actually um, will do you really well. And considering this is from such a small country, an unknown distillery, who no doubt are making not a lot of this at all. This is actually very, very good indeed. A whiskey that is using a wine cask to its full potential, definitely. The balance is actually really good. For some people, the red wine influence might be a little bit too OTT. You might find it a little bit too tannic. It's borderline for me. It's just about where where I would like it to be. Um, but I can see some people going, oh no, it's a little bit too drying. It's a little bit too whiny. And I get that. I, I fully understand that. Um, I do like the mouthfeel on this. I think it's, um, I love the creamy, rich character to it. That kind of cherry, almost cherry syrup that's in there. Um, definitely, as you've probably told already, cherry is the overriding flavor for me. And I'm not really that keen on cherry, but this is really, really good. Um, I'm very, very impressed with this. For such a, a small unknown distillery, who I'm sure are absolutely huge in Liechtenstein, but what their footprint is outside of that country, and particularly kind of outside of you know Switzerland, Germany, that sort of area, the further afield they go, I don't, you know, how much they're producing, how much they can distribute, but um, very, very interesting indeed. Um, the bottle itself is quite unusual. Um, I'll put the bottle back up again, but um, it, it, the, the uh, neck of the bottle is actually, it looks to be offset. So it almost looks kind of like as though it's been made wrong. But um, overall, quirky, interesting, unusual. If you can get it, that's going to be a challenge itself if you're not based in kind of that area of Europe. Um, but I actually think it's worth picking out. I think it's um, it's really good. And to put in a tasting of, if you were looking at wine cask uh, whiskies, doing a tasting of those, that would be a fascinating one to put in, particularly if you did it blind. Um, but the wine cask is definitely there. You know, they have done their job properly in that they are using a wine cask and you can tell that it is there, but they've actually balanced it really, really well. So Andrew, thank you very much for that. I very much enjoyed that. I would love to see a bottle in the flesh somewhere in the UK. Unfortunately, I don't think I will. Um, and I have a bad feeling that if I did, it would probably be a little bit pricey, but always nice to try something new. So do give it a go if you can find it. Right, that's that one done. I am gonna film another one so that you're gonna get two in relatively quick succession. So I shall see you at the next one. Cheers.